So let's transition to recurrent ovarian cancer. And fortunately, despite all of these changes in surgery, target therapy, scheduling, and route of administration, almost all patients recur. And they recur somewhere between 10 and 30 months. And you know, the better the prognosis, obviously, the longer the PFS. Um, in, in considering treatment of recurrent ovarian cancer, it all used to be platinum-resistant, platinum-sensitive. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's not true. It's an important factor. But, but, but Rob, you helped uh, Ronnie Alvarez write a paper about other factors other than the platinum-free interval that help determine what the best treatment is. Outline those other factors other than platinum-free interval. So obviously the BRCA status, Molecular which, signature. which we uh, talked uh, a lot about. Um, and I think that, you know, um, I think that, uh, that this whole dynamic actually is continuing to evolve as, as we know more about the molecular signatures, although that was a, uh, a very strong um, prognostic um, uh, factor in that. So a histologic uh, subtype, you said uh, that you his, don't treat your patients differently frontline based on the histologic subtype. Do you begin now in the recurrence setting to put your low-grade serous in this trial or that or the mucinous or the clear cell? Does it now begin to have more of an impact on treatment decisions? It absolutely has an impact on clinical trial consideration. Okay. So if you're talking about kind of standard of care, platinum, doxel, what have you, I don't, I don't know that it really impacts those decisions as much. But um, from a clinical trial standpoint, we know you have PARP inhibitors that are much more likely to work in patients that have a molecular signature HRD. Um, so you're going to be looking at, for that more in your um, high-grade serous and your uh, high-grade endometroid patients, although you're going to look everywhere for them. Mm -hmm. um, you have other targeted agents, targeted chemotherapy that are targeting to a certain protein in clinical trials that are much more likely in high-grade serous and high-grade endometroid. Uh, and that actually defines eligibility for a number of novel agents. Um, P53 so, number, targeted agents are going to be only in a certain histology. And so right. in the recurrent clinical trial world, it's gotten much, much tighter. Okay. Right. And I think that with the number of prior treatments, it adds to that. So the, as you start to build in the eligibility by histology, these, these prognostic factors, which we talked about as bracket, but there's probably going to be more other important so, ones. So you see a patient with a current ovarian cancer. What's the time from the last platinum? What's the molecular signature? What's the histologic subtype? Tom, tell us now what the role is the line of therapy. Does the line of therapy matter when you're treating recurrent ovarian cancer? And tell us how. Absolutely. Uh, so we, we know that, that, that not only is it important in terms of making decisions individually on patients, we, it's, it's probably a new pathway in yeah. terms of regulatory approval. Uh, we've seen that with uh, PARP inhibition in terms of fourth line and beyond. So, Angela, tell us about these drugs that we have approved. That also depends on the number of lines of therapy, right? They're, they're restricted. Yeah. Right, they are. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot is restricted for a uh, fourth line. Um, so, and that can be very challenging for certain patients by that time to take an oral agent mm -hmm. where their disease or their tumor burden may be difficult for them to tolerate um, drugs that are taken by mouth compared to IV drugs. And so I always want to move that one up. And then the other restriction is on bevacizumab. Yeah. It's approved mm -hmm not beyond second line therapy, mm -hmm. where I do think that drug has value line. beyond um, <laughs> that uh, line of therapy. So let's yeah. talk about that. So we had uh, December 6, 2016, a, a second approval in ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. platinum sensitive, and that's just a second line approval. Mm -hmm. But in platinum resistant, it's second and third. So we got platinum resistant BEV, second and third, platinum sensitive BEV, second, BEV is, or Laparib, fourth and beyond. So line of therapy, to your point, mm -hmm. In all of these treatments, in the old world, paclitaxel and carbo and PLD and all that, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, but today it does. So, but I think, let's get back to where we, we started with this, because I think that, you know, uh, many clinicians, they look at the definition of platinum sensitivity like a binary variable, I know, and, and they make a it's treatment decision things. about that. Yes. And I think that what we're describing here, though, as, you, as we get more in lines of therapy, we're talking about the nuances of the patient characteristics that actually help us to determine what might be the expected outcomes. We, don't, we still don't really ha know how to mix the salad together. That's why together. Tom says it might be a regulatory approval. We used to mm -hmm. think that the regulatory option was in platinum-resistant disease, but by the time you get fourth line and beyond, that doesn't, that's not the most important factor anymore. Right, yeah. But I, I guess what I was... And it's a mixture. It's yeah, a mixture. Platinum what I was getting at, though, is that, is that a lot of... I mean, you get the phone calls all the time, and they're saying, oh, I have this patient who has blah, 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 and those factors are being ticked off in, in, in that description. So 
part of that platinum-free interval in the past was used as guidance for therapy. And so how do we incorporate these things? It's not for a regulatory point. I mean, although that's going to be important for clinical yeah. trial purposes, but what, how do we guide the clinician well, as to what Katie, they're going to do? So how